Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for taking some time today to join us for our uh, our webinar. Uh, also, like to thank uh, Revolution EHR for providing us the opportunity to present these webinars to their users. We we appreciate our history and our partnership with Rev and, and enjoy working uh, with with the, the the user base. Uh, some logistics before we get started. Uh, the usual usual logistics. Uh, the webinar is uh, being uh, recorded, uh, and so you'll get an email with a link to it if uh, there's something you want to refer to, or if you want to forward it on to a, <clears throat> a colleague in, the, in, in your practice, uh, you'll get that in an email. Um, everyone is muted uh, just to keep the noise down, uh, the dog barking down, and um, but we will have a Q&A session, so you should see a question and answer uh, area in your GoToWebinar panel. You could submit those questions along the way, and we will grab a, a, a Q&A um, a, a session at the end. Um, so with that, um, let's let's dig in. Um, so practices. Uh, often reach us to uh, reach out to us for a variety of reasons uh, to to take on their uh, their billing. Um, often it's staff related, but um, one recurring theme we uh, we we run into is that uh, practices uh, often realize that their AR is is somewhat out of control, and and they look to us to uh, uh, to, to help fix that, and and we we can do projects around AR our clean, AR cleanup. Um, so we thought it might be helpful to to um, uh, dig into the uh, AR topic and and give some suggestions uh, to everyone on on how you and your practice can stay on top of uh, this uh, accounts receivable topic uh, and maybe improve some things. Um, we'll start with looking at uh, how to prevent um, uh, your AR from climbing, kind of a prevention set of uh, issues or topics or ideas. And then we'll dig into dig into ideas on how to tackle it once that AR does uh, appear. You know, how, how do you best work work that down um, throughout the month? And from, finally, we'll uh, we'll look at uh, and 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 give you some thoughts on how to monitor and manage the process uh, in your pra practice. For, you know, kind of from from start to finish. Um, we decided today to to um, enlist a panel of uh, uh, renowned experts to uh, to address the topic. Uh, my name is Paul Harchi. I'm the CEO of uh, RevCycle Partners, uh, and the other members are important uh, part uh, pieces of our, um, our operations team. And so I think I'll just let uh, everyone introduce themselves, get a little bit of their background, and and uh, then we'll dig into the topic. Melissa, you wanna wanna go first? Yeah, absolutely. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Melissa Jacobson. I am the operations manager at RevCycle Partners. I've been with RCP now for about two and a half years. Prior to this position, I was the chief operating officer for a multi-location optometric practice. And I've been in eye care for about 14 years. During that time, honestly, I've worn just about every hat that you can inside an optometry office, except for that of the optometrist, um, although sometimes I tried. <laughs> uh, I do also hold an MBA from the University of North Florida. Great. Casey? Hello, my name is Casey Squeakero, and I am a billing support group manager with RevCycle Partner. Uh, primarily, my position, I focus on staff development and training, and I've been with RevCycle Partners since 2015, so around six years. I've been doing optometric billing for 11 years, and prior to working at RevCycle, I did work in an optometrist office doing many of the various roles that probably many of you. Everybody does. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thanks. Sarah? Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Gray. I'm a billing and aging specialist here at RCP. I've been here two and a half years. My role is primarily in the billing side along with training in the aging departments, which is the really good thing of what we're going over today. And Prior to that, I was in an optometric office for seven years in the same kind of role, wearing many hats, and overall dealing with billing about nine years of the optometric side of billing. Excellent. Thanks, you guys. Appreciate you giving us the time today to, to present. Um, so let's uh, let's dig in. Um, 
and uh, we'll start as uh, as I mentioned on the kind of the prevention side and um, to, to how to how to keep your AR uh, intact from from not letting it grow to begin with. So uh, let me start with you, Melissa. I I, I know in any business there there tend to be things that are I don't know get done a certain way because they they you know always been done that way. Um, processes that get passed on from employee to employee and and things just don't change because you maybe maybe don't look at it. So let, let's pull the AR topic, you know, maybe back to back to the basics. You know, what are what are some of the system setup things that a practice should be reviewing and maybe 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 improving or fixing if necessary when you know if, if they want to dig into and 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 assess their AR processes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I, I, you know, I'll agree. I think it's definitely best practice to make a point to periodically review your processes and procedures in an attempt to uncover more effective and efficient ways of doing business and accounts receivable or AR really is no different. So I would recommend at least once a quarter, you take the time to review both how you are communicating with the payers and how they are communicating with you. You really should be checking your setup in Rev for each payer and making sure that you're submitting all claims electronically that you can. You know, if you use Trizetto, it's pretty easy to search for payer IDs and add them into the payer setup in Rev so that you're filing those claims electronically. You can just do a quick search for anything that is paper currently and update it. Um, if you're using Apex, you probably have to call them to inquire or you can get the payer ID from the payer directly. But submitting claims electronically will save you time and money. It's also going to create a paper trail should you need to appeal the claim. And then in addition to how you're sending claims, you should review how you're receiving remits and payments from the payers, EFTs and electronic remits are the fastest way to get paid. You'll often get your money at least one to two weeks faster and you'll never have to worry about checks getting lost in the mail. Great. So I, I mean, I can see how um, you know, doing everything, you know, everything possible electronically and automated, integrated uh, can make you more efficient, but, but maybe help me out. How does that, how does that, get your AR under control? How does that keep AR from, you know, growing? Mm -hmm. Well, the key with AR is that you want to find ways to avoid it, right? Yeah. So increasing claim submissions through your clearinghouse will result in less data entry errors, less mistakes, uh, you know, just less time in general. You won't need to worry about having the wrong mailing address or claims getting lost in the mail. Getting claims to the payers faster and more accurately means you get a claim process the first time you touch it. And in the insurance world, the sooner you know a claim's outcome, the better in case you need to get info from the patient, correct a claim, or even bill a patient for co-pays or deductibles so you know as the saying goes work smarter not harder got it got it uh, okay casey any other basics to review um you know for a practice any other items to review if they're looking to tackle on the ar process absolutely um kind of piggybacking off of some of the things that melissa mentioned is to ensure that you are checking your payer list and checking it you know often maybe even a designated time such as the beginning of a calendar year make sure that the payer ids that you do have listed are correct that the addresses if you are sending it by mail are correct updated phone numbers and fax numbers and also keeping all of that information in a centralized easy to access location primarily in your software you know updating it not on a separate document but updating it in your software um, in, in rev, in, in software rev, as it, as it, yes. got it, got it. Yeah. So um, something else that I think is helpful is to use your software to its full capability, such as if there are any default settings. So in Revolution, under your vendor partner where you set your insurance up, you can select to add a referring provider automatically to your claims. So your claims such as Medicare, you need to have the referring provider listed in box 17, check that box in your setup so that it automatically gets added. Um, one other thing would be that I can think of would be inside your inventory for your services. If you need a modifier to automatically be attached because it's needed on every claim, like the 55 modifier on your cataract post-ops, 
link that in your software so that it defaults and it's setting that up automatically on your claims, taking that one extra step away, um, making it less likely to make a mistake. Sure, sure. So, so Sarah, I don't, I don't know if others are experiencing this, but it, it seems to me that uh, in these days, there's, there's more and more problems with basic mail delivery. I know there was, it was even worse during COVID. It seemed to be, um, and and Melissa touched on it a, a, a bit, but I, you know, I, I would assume that you know, U.S. mail issues could be a factor in AR, whether it's lost claims or checks or delayed payments. A, a, any thoughts on how to eliminate the the mail issues from from the as as being an AR factor? <laughs> Definitely. The biggest thing is, is getting things set up electronically. If you have the abilities to submit claims through a clearinghouse, through an insurance portal, getting those payments electronically, your best bet is to be getting as much things taken care of electronically as you can. If for some reason there might not be an option for that, check to see if the insurance will allow you to submit claims via fax or that you can get your payments via fax like a virtual credit card. A big one that a lot of people don't know is that say you can't submit a claim on IMED, they do allow you to fax those claims in. So that does help take away the chance of getting that lost in mail delivery. Uh Another big thing with that is making sure that you've got the correct payment addresses, not only for, you know, what was said before of the correct addresses for the insurance companies to where claims could be going, make sure that they have the correct information for your office. It could be something as simple as just having to submit a new W-9 form with updated address information. Some insurance companies are even good enough that they'll update that over the phone with you instead of having to submit anything. And another thing is if say you don't have that capability to submit a claim electronically, you can sometimes find their portals for the insurances, like it can't go through your clearinghouse. You could go directly to that insurance company's portal and submit those claims. So you just want to make sure they're getting keyed in correctly. Great, sounds good. So uh, you know, we we as I mentioned before, we do uh, cleanup projects for practices um, to 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 you know tackle their AR, and and often I hear. Uh, you know, in, 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 in when this team is reviewing the projects or talking about the projects that, that uh, you know, a, 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 a AR, a stack of AR is, is, is uh, um, out there because credentialing is all messed up, you know, and, and, and that, that, that the, the underlying issue is, is, a, is a credentialing um, uh, problem. Um, and so I, I guess, I don't know, most of you want to take this one on how, how, you know, how, how, you know, what, what are, what are, maybe the question I guess is what are the, what are the typical credentialing issues that would cause AR to back up and then, and then how should a practice look to resolve them? Mm -hmm. The most frequent problem we encounter is definitely trying to submit claims to payers for which a provider's not credentialed. You know, I think this is most commonly seen with Medicare and Medicaid replacement plans. Providers just often believe that they can render services to any Medicare or Medicaid managed care plan because they're credentialed with basic Medicare or Medicaid. And what they don't realize is that when a patient signs up for a replacement plan, the commercial payer now replaces Medicare or Medicaid. So not only does the provider need to be credentialed with the commercial payer, but they also need to be contracted for that specific Medicare or Medicaid Advantage plan. Payer contracts don't typically include the Medicare Medicaid plans automatically. Uh, you do need to request them separately and sometimes even have to go through a completely different payer organization for contracting with these plans. So my first advice would be to make sure that for all of your commercial payers, if you want, that you're contracted for both Medicare and Medicaid plans. I think a second big issue is missing recredentialing dates. You know, sometimes payers will get termed from a network because they failed to recredential. Mm -hmm. Most payers are going to require you, you recredential every three to five years. So watch that. Some of it's automatic. Some of it, you just need to keep your CAQH up to date. Uh, but sometimes you actually have additional paperwork you have to fill out. So know your payers, know your requirements. And then probably the third is 
not fully understanding how uh, a practice is contracted with a payer and having set up wrong inside of Revolution. So when you're credentialing, there are options to contract as an individual or as part of a group. Each one's going to require different information on a claim. Sometimes you'll need an individual MPI, sometimes you'll need a group MPI. So when you fill out credentialing paperwork and you sign payer contracts, you need to pay close attention to how you're set up and know if there's any Thing additional needed on the claims. If there's a specific taxonomy code or a provider number that needs to be put in on the claim form, make sure you go into Rev and you set that up. You can always talk to your clearinghouse, you can talk to Rev help and navigate that if you're not sure how to do it, but uh, make sure that, that you're set up right. Well, one area we've been getting involved with from our credentialing business is <clears throat> practice acquisitions. There's obviously a, a lot of consolidation going on in the in the eye care space, and and, and I assume the credentialing topic there can get messy. Any any tips on how to approach that if a practice is you know merging with another location or adding a location? Mm hmm. Yeah, so when practice acquisitions occur, it's definitely common for the name, the tax ID, and the group MPI to change, and all of those are going to result in needing new contracts with insurance companies. Most payers are going to have varying timelines for completion of the credentialing and contracting, so it can get difficult to manage which payers have been converted to the new business info and which haven't. Certainly take good notes, keep good records. My recommendation is always to try to complete all credentialing and contracting prior to beginning to bill any new claims under the new entity. Just because once new contracts are in place and you start changing info inside of Rev, it's going to impact all of your payers, really. So having everything change at once for all payers will allow you to get a new clearinghouse set up if you need to, get new EDI paperwork sure. filled out, claims can go out in a much cleaner fashion. Cool. Thanks. Let's uh, <clears throat> let's switch over to the patient side of things. Um you know, for claims to be processed cleanly, obviously good patient data is critical. I wonder if somebody could, uh, you know, review for the, the group the, the important data to capture from the patients that's, that's going to, you know, flow downstream for, for clean claims. Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, the biggest thing, I think, is making sure that you have the patient's correct information, getting their legal name, not having it set up with a nickname or, you know, if it's a name that might be shortened. Also, the correct patient address as well as their date of birth. A big one with date of birth is you'll see sometimes the keying error of a number that might have been put in wrong. And of course, that can cause denials, which if not caught quick enough, will affect your aging. Um, another thing is the actual insurance details, getting the correct payer, the correct subscriber ID. If it happens to be a child or a spouse, making sure that you get that information from the actual responsible party on that. So their information, their date of birth, as well as group numbers. Another thing is, you know, we're over a year into the new Medicare MBIs and I'm still seeing offices that aren't updating to the new MBI. So making sure that you're getting a new record of what that is, is another big help that'll get you along in the process with your aging and always paying attention for those keying errors when putting in that information into Revolution. Great. So uh, maybe a follow up for either you, Sarah, or the group, anyone who wants to take it. Um, uh, so, that, you know, that it's a good summary of the data that that's re required. A any tips on the the process of gathering the patient data, I, I know that can be a challenge, you know, depending on how people are scheduling their appointments, whether they're scheduling them online or calling up, but any, any, any tips on the data gathering side of this? I can take that one again. Um, the big thing with that challenge is making sure you get that physical copy of a card from the patient. If you're able to get that and scan that into their patient file, that'll end up going a long way because you can always reference back to that and it'll save you time so you don't have to call the patient to have them review the card to where there might be an accidental number flip-flop or letter flip-flop in the ID if they're giving it to you over the phone. Also, making sure that 
the office is verifying benefits and eligibility ahead of time, you know, making sure if there is a deductible or co pay, because that can affect your AR going forward. Mm -hmm. Making sure you get the right submission address from the card. The insurance might be a smaller insurance that the office normally doesn't deal with, but it could be on the card that it's contracted through a larger commercial insurance. So making sure you have that correct data so it is going to the right place the first time. And also checking to make sure if the patient needs a referral or a prior authorization beforehand and making sure you're able to get that before the appointment will definitely save you time and keep hopefully keep those claims off your aging. Okay. I would uh, add good. with, you know, the to what Sarah said with Cigna specifically, that's one I've seen. I would make sure every time you have the front and the back of the card, Cigna is notorious for having 15 different claim submission addresses for various plans. <laughs> so you might get a denial and it just is because you submitted to the wrong address. So that's a good one. Good. Thanks. So we're, we're still on the AR prevention topic, uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, items there. Uh, so Casey, one, one, one more topic on that is um, maybe dig into the claim submission techniques um, that, that can help. So, you know, what are, what are the key things the staff can look for when reviewing or scrubbing a claim before sending it off to their clearinghouse or their payer portal? Um, so I would say, making sure that when you know whoever is scrubbing the claims that you're not just looking at the invoice side of it that in you know in the areas where you might be adding a modifier but after that claim is completely coded you're previewing it you know on in the preview screen you're checking to make sure there's no dashes in your medicare id you're checking to make sure that you have a full cpt code listed a five digit cpt code um, a valid diagnosis code making sure that you have no more than four diagnoses per line item. Otherwise, that will kick back. Um, when it, if you're submitting it electronically, it, it will kick back. Making sure that your claim is going to the correct payer. So whoever you know is, is taking the insurance up front and putting the insurance information under the patient, making sure when you're checking benefits and eligibility that you're listing the correct primary payer within um, the insurance pod for the patient. Um, I would say to make sure that you understand that the diagnosis or what the medical policy is so that you are billing a, an appropriate diagnosis with the proper CPT code. Um, and if you aren't sure, you can go out to the payer's website, um, CMS for Medicare, there's medical policies that you should be able to obtain, in most cases, a list that will show you if the diagnosis you're billing for is covered for the service that you're billing. Um, and I would also say that when it comes to adding modifiers to the claim, not only knowing you know, what codes require what modifiers, but really understanding the meaning and the definition behind the modifier, ensuring that when you are adding a modifier that's unbundling a code that you have the medical records to back up the necessity for that. So, you know, adding adding that modifier for reasons to just get paid isn't best practice. You want to fully make sure that you're meeting all of the requirements needed before adding the modifiers. Great, thanks. Uh, very thorough. So, one one final question uh, before we switch gears into the working AR. Uh, topic. Um, Melissa, any, any recommendations on things that can be done, you know, uh, in the regular flow of, of, of the, you know, of, of the office, you know, things that are being done while working other parts of billing to keep the AR in, in, in check? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the biggest opportunity to avoid a claim from even hitting your AR is watch for denials on EOBs and take care of them right away as soon as you see them. You know, as you're processing payments, you might come across a claim that's a non-pay or a zero pay. Go ahead and fix it right then and there. Or as soon as you're done posting that payment, make sure you address it. If you've got a resubmission that needs to be done, if you need to get information from the patient, you know, don't let that slip your mind. Also, watch for secondary claims. You know, when you're posting your Medicare remits, for example, 
check and see. It'll tell you if they're forwarding to the secondary payer. If you don't see that it's forwarding to the secondary payer, make sure that you do so manually and hopefully key them into your clearinghouse. Do your secondary submission through your clearinghouse, not mail, if you can. Take care of it again as you see it. Watch for secondary timely filing windows. Don't miss if you need to submit that secondary, don't put it off because you could miss your your timely filing Excellent. window. Mm -hmm. Great. Sounds good. A lot of good ideas on the prevention side. Uh, let's switch over to the uh, the topic of how to work the age claims or suggestions on, on working age claims because inevitably, even with all the prevention, there, there will be some AR that that creeps into the uh, into the practice. So um, um, what what um, I guess maybe the the, the, the on work and the the AR the, the you know the first question or thing is what what's the first step you know how you've got this outstanding AR you run an AR report monthly or something like that what's what's the first step in tackling the AR. <laughs> I would definitely say the first step in tackling that AR is prioritizing your payers and their timely filing limits, making sure that you understand those limits so you know when you can get those claims in without having to worry about getting that denial to where it'll add more time and possibly having to appeal. Um, take the time to look at your payers and try and sort those based on when you know those filing limits are so then you can attack those claims that are closer to that timely filing and then still making sure which insurances in the long run you might have a hard time getting that information from because those might take a little more time for you to work with if it's an insurance you know that you have to call on because there isn't a portal access for them setting that time aside to get through to them because the longer you wait to get that information the closer to that filing limit you are going to get. So, so let me, let me follow up on that. I, I, my understanding is that you know payers have different timely filing limits. I guess how, how granular can you get on the payer timing to to determine when to work that payer's claims? You can take that and look at it, and knowing if you have a claim that's going to hit timely filing at ninety days, you want to make sure that it, at least your first submission of that claim is done before that ninety days because with a lot of the insurances, once you have that first submission, it's almost as if it opens a whole new time limit for any of those corrections or appeals that you might have to have changes done to the claim. So knowing that you can at least get that first initial claim submitted is gonna be a big help in that long run. Got it, okay. What, what's everyone's thoughts on, on whether to weave AR into you know your the daily workload of of whoever you know whether it's a biller or the office manager that owns it you know kind of kind of weave it in uh, a bit at a time versus you know carving out a chunk of the time of the week and 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 just you know digging in and tackling all the AR tackling as much AR as possible like you know dedicating Friday afternoon to AR work versus you know working some of it every day any thoughts on kind of the incremental versus batch approach. I, I can speak to that. Um, so when it comes to working the AR, you know, depending on how large it is, it can be a little bit overwhelming as far as just pulling it and looking at it in total. So personally, I like a incremental, you know, working it within the increments because you can, you know, be consistent on when you're pulling your AR. So if you are pulling your report at the beginning of every month that's giving you a full month to look at and if you're looking at it in smaller sizes instead of looking at the total you should be able to see how many working days you have in that month how many total claims you have on your report and you should be able to break it down to a daily allowance of claims whether or not you get to them each day you may not, but it'll at least let you see, you know, if you have 66 claims to work for that month and you have 22 working days, that you could take three claims a day and try to work to those. If you can't do three a day, then you can do 15, you know, every Friday. So just looking at it in a smaller bite size approach can make it less overwhelming and 
more productive in my in my thoughts. Expert opinion. Yes. <laughs> any any other any other thoughts, uh, Sarah and Melissa, on the you know benefits of incremental versus batch, or how how your teams. Uh, I definitely, I definitely recommend exactly as Casey has said and, and support her thoughts there. You know, if you can break it down into bite-sized chunks and, and tackle it, you know, you know that with Blue Cross Blue Shield, the best time to call them is Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. I would make sure that I call them Wednesday mornings at 8 a.m. because my wait times are the shortest. <laughs> you know, yeah, I would yeah. I would break it apart and and have goals along those lines. Good. Great. Um how about a, how about appeals? You know, you're you're working the claims, you're 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 resubmitting them, and you're getting denied. And at some point, you're you come to the decision to file an appeal. Any, any tips on the appeals process? What you guys have found to either be efficient or to be successful? Any any tips there? I would say a big one with that when you're actually going to submit that appeal, making sure that for that specific insurance that there's not a specific claim uh, appeal form that you may have to submit. Some insurances I know do have a specific appeal form that you do have to send to give your reasonings for submitting that appeal as well as any supporting documentation you're sending. Also making sure that you have the correct appeals address. With Blue Cross Blue Shield, especially Anthem, there's multiple different Anthem plans, so making sure you're going to that correct insurance to submit that appeal is a big help. Anybody else? Others? So, Thank go ahead, Melissa. Oh, I was going to say documentation. <laughs> Send as much yeah. documentation with your appeal as you can. Again, going back to the importance of electronic submission, you can prove that you submitted a claim at a certain time, you can prove that you submitted it to the incorrect payer, excuse me, <clears throat> the incorrect payer even if the patient gave you the wrong information up front. If you mail something, it's your word against theirs, right? So have as much documentation as you can. I was going to add the same thing that, that you just mentioned to just make sure that you look at the total picture and you see not only, you know, when that claim was submitted to the payer that's denying it for timely, did you attempt to submit it to a payer prior to that? You know, and was it because the patient had given you updated uh, or incorrect insurance information or not, you didn't obtain the new insurance card? You can use all of that as, you know, a, a platform to appeal off of. And in many cases you can, you know, win an appeal for that. Also, if you have a situation that might have occurred that prevented one specific payer from paying a, a batch of claims or you know a specific amount of claims. See if sometimes they will actually allow you to submit one form, one spreadsheet with all of the claims that may have fell underneath that situation and they might be willing to do a one-time reconsideration, you know, because you sign up as a provider, you sign that contract saying you're going to submit within a certain time period we've had success where the payer has said you know this one time because of that one scenario send us you know the batch of claims we'll reprocess them going forward make sure you submit them within the timely the timely requirements so, so do you guys find in your experience that the appeals process is worth the effort? And I, I guess that nets do, 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 do we win enough appeals to make the time and effort to, to submit them worth it? Yes. Yes. <laughs> okay. Definitely. Short and sweet. Short and sweet. Yes. Do, the, do the appeals. I will, I will add to one other thing is in Revolution, you know, you want to make sure that you are checking your pending invoice report to see, you know, those claims, if, if they're pending just because you've never hit authorize those claims and they're just sitting there, that that's difficult because there's nothing really to appeal off of other than you forgetting to just authorize that claim to get that initial submission. So I would say pull your pending invoice report, pull your unassigned items report so that you're seeing any of those missed claims that are potential money for you to be getting. Great. All right, let's switch to the last topic uh, of of monitoring and and managing the the AR process. So, 
you know, depending on the size of the practice, all this work, you know, could be being done by one person or or, or might be multiple people that are that are touching all this. And so maybe look at Melissa, maybe you can look at it from the office manager perspective or even the doc owner's perspective. What what suggestions would you have for you know monitoring and managing your accounts receive your insurance accounts receivable uh, as you're trying to manage your practice? Yeah, I think Casey's recommendation just a moment ago is a great place to start. Know where to find the information in Rev. You can go to your accounting screen. You can run a pending invoice report. You should monitor that, and you should monitor your uh, authorized insurance report as well. You can find it in two places in Rev. You can go to your admin and run your aging report, or you can go to the accounting screen and run your authorized insurance invoices. Um, either way, we'll show you your current AR. Uh, just make a habit of running it. Even if you don't really know what you're looking at, <laughs> you can see the total number and the total claims, um, and that should give you something to ask your staff about. You know, and and I would make sure you are asking. Keep the team focused on the status. Keep the team focused on the progress. You know, if if there's opportunity, maybe the front desk is putting it keeps keen in ID numbers incorrectly. Identify that problem and try and fix it. If you're not getting eligibility and benefits properly, if you're not being proactive and getting those member IDs over the phone and checking before they visit, make sure that you're speaking to that and that you're getting your staff trained to do that. If there are coding issues that are coming up that are causing claims to deny, find your LCDs, get your staff to go out and learn how to see those LCDs, um, local coverage determinations, and make sure that they understand when uh, you know, claim can be billed or can't be billed. Ask your staff set up a, a time that they're required to go in and do those setup and configuration checks that we talked about. Uh, if there are training opportunities, you know, Corcoran's a great group. I don't have any any interest there. You know, um, I, I'm only mentioning them because I've done training with them in the past. Have par participated in their. Um, training as a as a student so you know i would recommend looking into education opportunities um, but it's just important that you're talking about it you're thinking about it you're looking at it how about how about kpi tracking you know i i, I know a lot of practices do that you know in the optical relative to um, sales in the optical and tracking that kind of stuff from various metrics any any specific metrics that chase or monitor from the from the AR side? Yeah, if you use Trizetto, I would make a point to learn how to see your rejections in Trizetto, your EDI errors. Um, and I would make a point to get that as close to zero as you can. That's an easy low hanging fruit. If a claim has, uh, you know, is missing a diagnosis code, it's going to error out, for example. Um, that's just attention to detail. So I would track your rejections. I would track your aging percentages. You know, again, the aging report under the admin screen can give you an idea of your aging percentages. Um, I, I would know those and ha set a goal. And if it's increasing, if you're getting higher and higher aging buckets, then that's a that's a problem. Um, right. Thanks. That's good. Let's uh, keep moving on. I, I'm going to show this screen here, and we will. There's some resources that the team put together that, that they find useful, and we thought we would share with you guys. You don't need to scramble to copy these down. We'll send. Uh, we'll send links to these out uh, when we, we follow up with uh, the recording link as well. But I uh, uh, just wanted to show those. And then um, we're, we'll are, are going to do there's a couple few questions that have come in. So we'll we'll grab uh, those and answer those in a bit. And, and if anybody uh, has additional questions, now's the time to probably submit them. I was going to spend two minutes uh, just chatting about our RevCycle services as, as it relates to AR and claims and billing. We, we, we provide billing, outsourced billing services for practices. 
um, uh, practices outsource either their medical and or their vision claims. It's uh, you know up to them based on their needs in the practice and workflow and and and, and things like that. Um, but we're gonna you know do you know all the work that we kind of chatted about today from uh, the upfront scrubbing of claims, submitting them through your clearinghouse, your por uh, portals. Um, fixing, refiling, uh, refiling, appealing, the, the whole life cycle, if you will, uh, of a claim. And ultimately, we, you know, if you sign up for our services, we end up owning that, the, the insurance side at least, uh, the AR, and we monitor and manage it and, and, and work that for you on, on, on an ongoing basis. Our fees are uh, based on what we collect for you. So our, it's 7.5% of net uh, from for, for medical payers and four and a quarter for vision payers, and, and net being the key word there. Any... Uh, let's say any uh, if you we're processing EOBs and and any any um, patient responsibility that we move over to a patient does not get included in in, in our invoices relative to those percentages. And then we also do custom uh, AR cleanup projects um, that either in conjunction with ongoing services or separate. So those are our billing services. Uh, we are, we are actually in the middle of a Q2 promotion. Uh, around uh, around the billing services. Um, so uh, again, you'll get a link to this in the, in the follow-up email, but uh, that's for anybody that signs up for, for uh, uh, services by the end of the quarter. I'll let you guys figure out why 406. Whoops. Um, that's a, a unique baseball number. So if you're a baseball fan, you might know that. If not, you can, you can Google it. Um, and with that, let's uh, open it up to questions here. Let me scan the, um, some of the questions here. So here's a question on uh, percentages, kind of the buckets, Melissa, you were talking about relative to the different percentages. Uh, what percentage should aging be for claims 60 days or less, 60 days or more, um, et cetera? Any, any, any rule of thumb guidance on, on, the, on the buckets? Really, every practice is different, to be honest. It's going to depend on your payer mix. If you've got payers that are slower, you know, if you do a lot of champ, VA, for example, they take two years to pay sometimes, you know, every practice is going to be a little bit different. So I think the biggest key is to making sure your buckets aren't increasing, you know, that they are rather decreasing. You know, I'll, I'll say that a couple percentage points is usually the standard across the, the industry. You know, if you're looking at 90, oh, you know, 90 and above in aging days, somewhere between eight, 10% would be the highest that you would want to see your aging, assuming you're an average practice. Um, some certainly might be less and some might be a little bit more depending on your payer mix, but just make sure that it's not increasing. Oh, great. Uh, here's kind of a broad one. The question is, what is the timely filing limit for insurance claims? I know that varies. You guys want to just kind of touch on it and give some examples maybe? So I would say um, it's going to vary. Either <laughs> it, it is dependent on not just the payer. So Aetna could be the payer, but it could be dependent on the plan as well. So each payer may have multiple timely filings. I think the, the key piece of information to to know is, you know, if, if whatever payers you're dealing with on a regular basis, just to know at least those and in, in for the different plan types. Um, but like, you know, we know as a whole that your United Healthcare is your Aetnas. They are usually a less timely filing um, than the other payers. So that's kind of like a priority payer to work first on your aging each month. Um, but they may be different. You know, 120 days seems to be average for most of the Aetna plans. Um, United Healthcare can vary anywhere from 60 days to I would say 90, 120 days. Medicare, you do have 365 days with your Medicare claims and some of the Medicare replacement claims, you know, even if it is an, an Aetna, and I don't know offhand how me, what the timely filing is on Aetna Medicare, but sometimes your um, Medicare replacement plans do have, you know, the same Medicare, the same timeline as Medicare, which is 365 days. Great, thanks. This one's more of a, a, a comment than a question, or it is a comment, not a question. Uh, that kind of came in, I think, around the time we were, uh, early on, we were talking about um, uh, 
you know, doing as much electronically as possible. And so the uh, attendee said, I thought I'd just share this with, for everybody. It says exam refraction context can be submitted electronically through IMED with their payer ID. We have been doing this now for three months, uh, for about three months, and it has helped so much. Um, so just a comment there. I don't know if you guys, anybody wants to comment on the comment, but uh, it's yeah, back to I do have one comment on it. You know, I, I think that's a great tip. My only word of caution is make sure that you understand what modifier to put on the fitting to indicate that it's a premium fit. Um, and then also make sure that you're using the correct CPT for your contact lenses. You want to use, at least uh, last time I checked, you want to use S codes instead of V codes because you will get docked, I believe, 5% of the allowance if you use a V code. So that, you know, it's been about uh, a year or two since I have done an electronic IMED claim that may have changed, but. Just, just double check if you're going to go that route. Got it. Thanks. Um, a couple of RevCycle specific questions, if the group doesn't mind us taking those. Uh, cool. One first one is: Our practice is currently using both Trizetto and RevCycle. Uh, if there are any credentialing issues with either of uh, either of our doctors, would would RevCycle alert us? Absolutely. Take that. What's... Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so if we... how, what, what, maybe, maybe, maybe let me clear up. Let me, let me drill a little deeper. When would we figure that out? And then how would we notify the practice? Yeah. So most payers are going to deny a claim in that situation using a reason code that the provider is not credentialed or provider not right. in network. If we see that, we're going to reach out to the office. We'll, we'll send you a message or a task and let you know that that's what we're seeing. And and uh confirm with you yeah got it but definitely something we we take note of obviously mm -hmm. um and uh, uh another rev cycle trizetto question since we use both trizetto and rev cycle are claim errors being caught or do we still need to look at the trizetto error page i can speak to that i will say that we do work the rejections out of trizetto so if you're looking at your errors if you're if your clearinghouse is trizetto you can see documentation of those rejections on your error tab in your claims we work those from the rejection report in trizetto and they should be you know as we're working them we're marking them off as well go ahead melissa if you want to add anything to that nope that's good yep good good um so, so we're getting we're getting pretty close to uh, the, the time limit a couple of last uh questions um uh, this one's kind of general is there any way to get really old claims paid i can take that one it's to be honest it's about being persistent with those claims if you know that it's a claim that's been submitted and it was submitted during you know the timely filing periods and you've attempted to appeal as keep that documentation of when you've talked to the insurance companies what type of appeals you've done there's there's a chance that you may be able to still get it paid it just it it definitely takes work and fighting for that claim to get it paid i will say that sometimes you should also not be afraid to make the difficult decision not to chase the claim you know if it's a davis vision claim that's super old and you know your documentation isn't super strong you might spend more time and therefore money trying to get the claim paid and being very unsuccessful than it's worth sometimes you've got to make that that decision we have practices that come to us and we navigate that conversation with them and we find sometimes that it is better in their interest to just just let it go yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay um last question and uh it's, it's a rev cycle uh, kind of pricing question so uh, maybe i'll start with it but uh what's the price for rev cycle working our old claim so i think you're alluding to you know us doing a cleanup project which we do um, we'll, we'll do those for practices whether we're working there, um, uh, you know, uh, ongoing services, whether whether they're signed up for ongoing services or, or they just want us to do just that. Uh, it, it's really a custom pricing uh, model. Um, what we'll do if, if someone brings us a project like that, 
uh, will uh, um, you know get their uh, AR report, get an AR report from them, and will analyze it based on uh, quantity of claims, age of the claims, payer mix of the claims. Uh, and based on that, and you know our our history of of working these types of projects, uh, provide a custom quote. So I really can't can't quote a price here. It, it, it's all dependent on 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 those kind of factors. So um, that's that. And it looks like that's the end of the questions, and we're rolling into the, to the end of the hour. So I think we'll call it a wrap. Again, want to uh, first thank the panelists. Thanks guys for for uh, giving us the time to to, to add your expertise to this. Uh, thanks to Rev for giving us the opportunity to um, um, present to, to their user base, and, and thanks to everyone for taking the time. Um, we do have, we'll, we'll, in addition to the, all the other stuff I've, I've mentioned uh, that we'll send you in an email, we'll also send you some contact information. So I'm sure there's plenty of ways for you to find find us either through Rev or or, or, or through our website. So uh, with that, uh, we'll we'll call it a wrap. Thanks everybody. Appreciate your time. Thanks. <laughs> Bye everyone.